Andrew, my first question would be, um, your criticism of Web 2.0 is legendary. So could you sum up what, what it is, basically, and what mm, you think now, after all, the, all this time? Maybe the, your thoughts evolved about it, perhaps? I don't know. You tell us. Um, well, it's nice to say it's legendary. I always think I'm a legend in, uh, in my own eyes, but nobody else. Uh, I don't think they're legendary. I think I wasn't alone in making those criticisms. I made the book, uh, Cult I wrote the book Cult of the Amateur in uh, 2007. And um, at the time, it was greatly criticized because it, it really made two or three different arguments. Firstly, it suggested that the, 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 digital, the free digital economy wasn't really viable. It was very hard for people in content to make, um, to make money uh, off advertising. And I think that's as true now as it's ever been. I think I've been proved right. There still aren't really any muggles of um, giving away the stuff for free and then collecting on advertising on the back end. Uh, and the, the traditional cultural industries, books, records, um, um, uh, music, uh, publishing, they're all in, if anything, more of a crisis now. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't ways to make money. Some of the blogs became businesses like TechCrunch, where, um, where I have a, a show. But mostly the blogs didn't translate into real businesses. And mostly when people give their stuff out for free on the internet, even on you know, very widely distributed networks like YouTube, they can't make any money. Uh, I also made the argument that uh, piracy was a bad thing, that it destroys the cultural industry. I think that's as true today as it's ever been. Although I don't think the problems of, of piracy perhaps are as paramount or as salient as they were six or seven years ago. And finally, I made the point that when you do away with traditional cultural authorities, um, it leads to a kind of chaos and anarchy in cultural terms and political terms. And I think that's being borne out today uh, in the sense that uh, there's less and less certainty from a cultural point of view. Uh, you're seeing it in Italy. I know you're in Italy with the rise of Grillo as a political force. I understand the reasons behind his rise, but he's still kind of an empty vessel. So I do fear the kind of crisis of the elites, which I wrote about in Cult of the Amateur, and which I may continue to write about. Indeed. Um, you know, I've read uh, some time ago, I've read an article by a writer who had published his uh, book on Amazon. And he actually confessed, almost ashamed, that in fact the revenue of this book from this book even though it was one of the first 10 books on Amazon for a very long time it wasn't very very high it was actually a very low pay right. so what do you think about that well um, I think he's right and I, you know again that was the point I was making I think I may have even seen the same piece that you saw um the reality is that it's it's very, very hard to publish one's own work or one's own music or one's movie and make a living out of it. The, the traditional intermediaries are still the best people to actually do that. They're not always that good. I, I'm a writer. I understand some of the problems with publishers. Um, but at the same time, there's no miraculous solution because the internet allows anyone to publish. It does, and it's a lot of fun. Anyone can open a blog, anyone can have a Twitter feed, but it doesn't enable you to make a living. And what worries me in Cult of the Amateur, what worried me in Cult of the Amateur and continues to worry me, is, uh, you know, where, where's the next, uh, if you want to think in Italian, you're an Italian website, right? Is this for an Italian audience or broader? Yes. Well, actually, it's translated uh, in Italian and kept in English as well. So the post will be published uh, so in both languages. Where is the next uh, uh, Umberto Eco or Calvino or Bertolucci? Um, 
And Italy is a slightly different economy where you have more state support. But in America, it's really hard to make a living. I know as a writer, it's a real struggle. And um, this economy doesn't make self-publishing, self-authoring a viable business. Even even the, the new sort of sexy businesses like Spotify are struggling. Uh, they may have a huge amount of members, but the kind of revenue that they're driving to musicians is minimal. You, know, you have to get millions, literally tens of millions of, of listens on Spotify to earn any kind of serious living. So I'm still very, very dubious about whether or not this economy, whether this new technology platform can support um, a cultural economy and enable writers, filmmakers, musicians, journalists to earn a living. That's what I most care about, both personally and politically. Um, you know, um, many have hoped that the access, the, the democratization of access to publishing platforms of all sorts for any kind of, uh, of format would actually uh, um, praise merit. And, you know, many thought that, you know, the, the Internet and Web 2.0 would actually... Um, bring forth those who were most um, able in producing quality content. And yet, that seems not to be the case. Do you think we failed in, in this? And why? Um, well, I've, well, it's not we failed. I don't believe it's a question of we or even failure. It's, again, a, a kind of delusion about... Um, what realistically can come out of the, the digital economy. Um, firstly, and this is an endless debate, which some of your you know, people will feel strongly about one way or the other. I don't think the old economy was actually that bad at recognizing talent. It wasn't perfect. I understand that the publishing industry, the film industry, um, has its own kind of cultural biases. Um, but mostly... I think talent did get rewarded. I always use the example of um, John Hammond, the, the Columbia Records A&R person. He was the person whose um, who's, who's business, whose livelihood was spent finding young talent, signing her up to Columbia Records, investing in that talent, and allowing them to have careers as recorded musicians. Now, Hammond not only discovered Bob Dylan, but he also discovered Bruce Springsteen and Leonard Cohen. Now, maybe lightning strikes once, but certainly not twice or three times. And what all those careers show you is that record labels who have been vilified by many people on the Internet, and I know they're not ideal, and they're, in some ways they're exploitative of musicians, but record labels were in the business of investing in significant talent, allowing these musicians to develop. You know, Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run was his third album. That was his breakthrough album. Uh, my favorite Bob Dylan album, Blood on the Tracks, was, God knows, 20th, 25th album. And musicians need, it's like any kind of creative artist, they need that kind of investment. The publishing industry did do that. They don't do it so much anymore. But... What's the alternative today? The alternative is that the talent supposedly rises to the top because they get the most views on YouTube. But you might think, well, what would happen if a, a young Dylan was on the Internet? There are young Dylans on the Internet, but are they being recognized? Probably not. The ones who are being recognized are the ones who are able to come up with 30-second videos on YouTube or have very slick marketing or self-promotional tools. So I'm not convinced that this supposed democratization of culture, which, um, you know, it depends what really you mean by democracy, but this supposed democratization of culture is enabling the rise to the top of really talented people. If I was a young, talented person, uh, I think I would prefer the old economy to the new economy. Neither are perfect, but I'm far from convinced that the new economy is any better, and in many ways I think it's worse. All right. 
Um, you talked earlier about the fact that in Italy there are also some state aids, and indeed there are, uh, especially for newspapers. So, but the, the interesting thing is that many um, many people want them uh, gone. You know, they say that it would be better to not have any kind of state aid for newspapers because that way the newspapers would thrive only on um, on. Um, what's being bought, you know, the, the copies they sell. Bless you. Thank you. So how do you see that from, from your perspective? Well, I have to admit, I'm not a great fan of state aid to newspapers. I think that's very problematic on lots of levels. Uh, you can have successful newspapers. Uh, the New York Times, for example, doesn't take money from the United States government, but is a fairly successful business, maybe not as quite as successful as it likes. Um, Rupert Murdoch has built a successful newspaper business without relying on the state. So I, I'm personally not sympathetic to the state becoming involved. I think that's very problematic. And then you get situations like the BBC, which isn't a newspaper, but is a broadcasting network, which is state-supported and it creates a lot of resentment. I also think with a newspaper, it's very, very hard to do a truly objective newspaper. I think the best newspapers, in fact, are biased. I like both the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Uh, one is liberal, one's conservative, and they're not really shy about their politics. I think government-owned newspapers would be much less comfortable with revealing their ideologies. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, I think we have to rely on the market. And if there isn't a market, then you can't have newspapers. People don't deserve them. We don't have any kind of God-given right to newspapers or anything else. If, if there's no economy there, then people are going to have to live without them. All right. So um, there has been a lot of talk about the fact that the news are no longer something that needs to be paid for. Because with the internet and online newspapers, uh, nobody, well, not many are um, are going to, to buy news, I mean, paper, the paper newspaper anymore. So um, what do you think about yeah. the new kinds of business models? Excuse me. It's the business models don't work, really, I think. The paywall model is the best model. The only way you can survive online is... Um, if you, if you create a paywall and get people to pay for their news, news shouldn't be free. shouldn't be any more free than food or rent. I mean, unless you're a communist or something and believe that nothing should be paid for, uh, news has to be paid for because otherwise how are journalists going to be paid? The, the free model doesn't work. There's no examples of free news online being viable. Uh, no newspaper, every newspaper is relying on the paywall, from the New York Times to the Murdoch newspapers to the Financial Times um, to the Daily Telegraph. The only one that seems to be able to survive without a paywall is the London Guardian. But they're only able to survive because they're not, they're not a real business. They, they're, they're, they're less reliant on establishing themselves in profitable terms because they get a huge amount of cash from the a, a, tra a charitable trust. So I just don't buy this idea that news should be free. It can't be free. I mean, even the BBC, which is in a sense free, people have to pay for through their, um, through their, uh, through their license fees. So I, I don't believe either in the reality or even the ideal of free news, any more than free cars or free rent or free food. That wonderful idea is in theory, but in practice they're absurd. All right, so I'm going to read um, the question that uh, we got on uh, Twitter. And it is from Scott Grimwise, who asks you, when was the last time you set foot in a public library? Um. That's a good question. I don't know. Why, why, what's the point of the question? I'm not against libraries. I really don't know. <laughs> we should ask Mr. Grimwise about that. I have no idea. I don't know the point of the question. I believe in I think libraries are good things, and I support them. 
but uh, you know, I'm busy. And then I sometimes go to, when I go to libraries, I take my kids there. Uh, when I, I used to live in Berkeley, which has better libraries, I probably, I go with my daughter from time to time. Probably the last time I went was two or three months ago to the Santa Rosa Library. Awesome. Awesome. And I would, I would really like to, to ask you a few questions about um, Digital Vertigo. Yeah. Uh, well, the book, um, you know, it's a, it's a critique of, um, of, prior, of, of social media, an attack on the idea of uh, the end of privacy, a defense of privacy, mystery, secrecy. And um, I'm very pleased with it. It's a kind of a remix of Hitchcock's movie Vertigo about a world of surveillance and paranoia. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a book that I hope all, the, uh, all Italians will read, either in English or ideally in translation. The book, I think, is either out or will be out very soon. Um, yes, it is out. Yes, indeed. It, uh, it was published this year, so uh, it's probably just out in the libraries right now as we speak. Right. Um, one last question I'd, la I'd like to ask you is, um, where do you think this is all going? I mean, um, there is well, so much content. Um, sorry. sorry. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to be writing a book for next year, sort of analyzing 25 years of the web's history from 1989 when Tim Berners-Lee kind of invented the World Wide Network or invented the idea of the World Wide Network to 2014. Uh, we've had 25 years of this thing. So far, I think it's been a massive failure. It's undermined most of our cultural economies. It's created a lot of unemployment. Um, it's generated a, a cultural crisis, but hasn't re uh, undermined the traditional elite, but hasn't um, replaced that elite. So I think, I don't know where it's going, but I think in the next 25 years, we really have to, um, we really have to come up with better solutions to the cultural chaos the economic problems of unemployment, of disintermediation that the networks created. Um, All right. You know, there is one joke, let's, let's say, um, about it. You know, it's what would you tell a person that would come from the past, from the 50s, for example. You'd say, I have a device in my pocket with which I can access information from all over the world, and I use it to look at pictures of cats and, arg and argue with strangers on online. So, right. what do you, <laughs> do you think about that? I don't know. What would you call it? What? What would you call it? What? The device? What is the answer to that? Well, done. I don't know. It's uh, it's a waste, in my opinion. Yeah, you may be right, but we have to get it right because it's not going away. <laughs>